Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 562nd episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have the creator of Closers, Cole Gordon, and we get into the seven steps that every individual must overcome themselves before they're ready to buy from you. So uh, Cole rattles these off. So I think he knows a thing or two about sales and making salespeople. So he's got an interesting program. Uh, we get into that at the end, but um, he helps create salespeople for companies. Uh, he helps salespeople find jobs, you know, get kind of a certification. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, you'll see his ads everywhere. Uh, he's built a nice business and we get into how he does it, but also um, how to make more sales. So get ready. And um, if you need that kind of help as well, if you want to do it on your own, check out makeeverysale.com. Um, no promo code is needed, so avail yourself of the new lower price. And if you want ongoing assistance every week, join us, sellmoreofeverything.com. All right, go do that, get started, pause this, go and roll, then come back and listen to this episode with Cole. Cole Gordon, closers.io, all the way from Ohio, man. Welcome to the sales podcast. How the heck are you? I'm doing good, man. How are you? Thanks for having me. Hey, I'm asking the questions here. I don't, don't turn this around. I don't use some NLP magic stuff on me. All right. Gotcha. All right. I had a moment there. Um, closers, do people, do we need closers anymore? I thought it was all kumbaya, man. I thought we like did some TikTok twerking and people just bought our stuff. Do, do, I, do I even need salespeople? You need salespeople. Well, it depends. I mean, typically, I think if, if you're uh, if you're selling anything above three thousand, uh, three to ten thousand. I mean, three to ten thousand is kind of the minimum range. But I mean, obviously, you go into the million dollar range or wherever. Yeah, I think I think phone sales is probably, especially for service providers, the best channel to actually close the sale. In my opinion, um, is this? For cold calling or for inbound, a little bit of both. Like where, where is a closer needed? Well, I mean, it depends. I, typically, when people say closers, they're talking about the person who's taking an inbound call or taking an outbound set, right? But uh, you know, in terms of the the positions that that we staff, and then also like salespeople we train, salespeople we place on the other side, um, and even if you look at my company, I mean, I have a floor of probably 25-ish salespeople and we have tons of MDRs, we have some SDRs and we have, uh, you know, account executives, which is like your closers, uh, so to speak, right? And so your MDRs is leveraging your, your marketing contacts. Uh, so maybe your book buyers or your opt-ins or whatever, calling them who've already heard about you at least a little bit, they're still kind of cold and setting them on the calendar. But an SDR in my company at least, is reaching out to you and you have no idea who we are, right? So through an email, through a cold call, that stuff all works. Uh, it's harder for sure. It's easier when you have good marketing and good sales working in unison. Much, much easier, but you could still just have a good old outbound sales floor and, and do pretty well. So what are these, what are these initials, MDR, SDR, AE? I mean, we're talking about KPIs and ROIs, right? Because if the VP hears that the VC is on QP, uh, never mind, that's an old movie. But, you know, what are these acronyms? Yeah, so SDR is a sales development rep. MDR is a marketing development rep. So long story short, the reason I use those acronyms, ac- ac- acronyms, 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 <laughs> the reason I uh, the reason I use those is because a marketing development rep is very different in the sense that they're capitalizing on leads generated by marketing. That could be like a web form filled out on your website. That could be a Facebook ad lead form. I mean, it could be any of those things. Whereas an SDR is is actually like the typical outbound salesperson that we think of, who's like pounding the payment, they're cold calling, they're sending emails. Like it's more business development. So that's why I did differentiate that because they're different roles. Um, I typically don't have my MDRs do SDR stuff and my SDRs MDR stuff. It's very different type of roles, even different, a little bit different sales cycles, even if it's the same product. And then an AE, uh, in, in the software world, that's what they refer to, uh, to the closers, right? The ones who take the calls. Doesn't mean your account executive can't do its own little bit of prospecting. I think they should, uh, especially when they have downtime or calendars are light. But um, yeah, the account executive is like the closer. So. 
Is that word closer? Is that is it misunderstood? I mean, is this somebody? Is the old jerky boy say you buy this stuff right now, man? I rip your face off, or is it a little more subtle? <laughs> yeah. So the way I teach it is the salespeople we've trained. We probably placed at this point. Um, I don't know. I almost want to say like ten thousand salespeople. That sounds like a lot, but a lot of salespeople. Uh, the methodology that I teach is that there's basically seven beliefs that the prospect has to have to buy. And what we want to do is essentially through asking questions, break down the limiting beliefs and rebuild the empowering beliefs, the seven beliefs they need to have to buy before we even talk about what we have to sell, before we even transition into the close. So instead of like hard closing the prospect, if we do that correctly, the prospect's going to close themselves and they're going to do it because they view us as a leader and not a salesperson. Now, does that mean that, you know, on the flip side, you kind of swing the pendulum back the other way. You have kind of all these like real softy salespeople nowadays. And they're, uh, they're like really light with their questions and they're like, Oh, well, where do you want to go from here? You know, like, look like, so I get the trust-based language and I get all that stuff. But, uh, the reality is, is that there's times you have to hold somebody accountable to align their actions with their words. You know, in a very complex B2B sale, okay, you're probably not going to like be doing any sort of higher pressure closes or anything like that. But if you're selling somebody, you know, Nancy, who's 42 years old and wants to lose weight and she's really scared and it's a $3,000 program, you know, if you don't get it on that call, you're probably not going to see Nancy again. So in that instance, if Nancy tells you on the call the entire time about how important this is to her and how you know, she's tired of mommy, you know, or uh, her her daughter hopping on her lap and saying, mommy, you feel squishy and tired of, you know, uh, not feeling good or not having energy and not potentially going to be around for the next 10, 20 years because the longevity is not there. She says all those things in the beginning. And then at the end, it's like, well, let me think about it. It's like, well, you just told me for 30 minutes that this is the most important thing to you. And this is what you need to get to where you want to go. And now you're saying, insert whatever they said. So what's really going on? And so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of both, right? I, I think the connotation of a closer, when you, when you hear a closer, it's like that guy who gets on the phone, you, yeah, he asks you one question and then it's like, he just closes you or, or tries to at least, you know, we want to go really deep with our discovery and really flush out uh, all the things we need to do and, and do that whole seven beliefs thing that I teach before we transition into our pitch. But that doesn't mean you don't ha- hold them accountable at the end. Is that some proprietary stuff or can you share some of these beliefs? I can share whatever you want, man. Okay. Yeah. So there's seven beliefs the prospect has to have to buy. There's pain, doubt, cost, desire, money, support, trust. Right. So pain is that they have to have a problem or a gap. So there's really two types of problems. There's an actual pain and there's an unfulfilled desire. All right. So a pain is like you got back pain. You got to go to the chiropractor. It's like, I got a headache. I'm going to go buy an aspirin. So it's like a real pain we're moving away from. Whereas an unfulfilled desire is something we're moving towards. So an unfulfilled desire is, well, I'm I'm healthy. I am, you know, 185 pounds right now and I'm 12% body fat, but I want to get to 6% body fat and compete on stage and, and win some award. Right. That's an unfulfilled desire. It's not really a pain that I'm moving away from. It's something I'm moving towards. It's not as binary as away from and towards because everything is fluid. There's always typically something you're moving away from a little bit and something you're moving towards, but we have a pain versus an unfulfilled desire. Another way to think about it is a pain is moving from subpar to par. So from below average to average and an unfulfilled desire is moving from average to above average, you know, par to excellence is, is, is one somebody once told me. So you have to first establish the pain. Everything else is, is predicated on the pain. Okay. The reason for that is because business is about solving problems. That's because when you solve a problem, you create value and people exchange money for value. So sales is really just the demonstration. We can solve a problem for somebody else. So if there's no problem, there's no sales. We have to establish what that gap is, pain, unfulfilled desire, whatever first. Then the next thing, this is not necessarily the syntax of the sales process. However, you could do it this way. You could. Uh, the syntax is a little bit different, but you can talk about that later if you want to. But the next belief is doubt, right? So they have to have some sort of belief that going with you, whether that's buying a software, whether that's buying a coaching program, whether that's buying whatever, 
is going to be better than them trying to do it themselves, right? Um, and doubt doesn't necessarily mean like they have to not believe they could do it themselves, even though it could mean that. It could just be but the belief that they would rather take a faster route that's a more effective route of getting there that's going to be less time, resources, energy, et cetera, than DIY. It's really answering the question, why not DIY, okay? Cost means that if they stay where they're at, essentially, it's more painful, it's more costly in the form of time, energy, money, attention, all that stuff, than investing, than the pain of investing into your product or service, right? So when Tony Robbins talks about the Dickens process and like, you know, this is an example he always used where he, he builds leverage on the thing that you want to change in your life by having you imagine, you know, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, what's going to happen if nothing changes and how bad things are actually going to get, right? And then he wants to bring that to the present moment to build up costs so somebody changes their behavior. So that's really what cost is. Now, obviously on a sales call, you're not going to have somebody do the Dickens exercise, but it, it's very similar to that. It's usually asking the questions, why is this important now though? What's going to happen if nothing changes? Now you don't just ask those questions flat out. You have to set up those questions the right way. That's what people, the difference between a novice and a very advanced person is the setups, right? So it sounds natural, not like you're going through a script. So this cost, paint out cost, desire is the payoff if they fix the problem. So it's a compelling future what happens when they fix the problem. So you see how all these things are predicated on the problem. Doubt is the inability to fix the problem. Cost is that if the problem goes unfixed, it's going to be much more costly than the investment and the time, energy, and attention of investing in whatever you're selling. Desire is a compelling payoff of fixing the problems. So we have to have the problem first. Remember that. Then there's support, which means the people around you or the stakeholders will support you in making that decision. So that could be your board. That could be your wife. That could be your business partner, whatever. Right, that could be your team. Like, I actually didn't make a decision on a on a product we were going to buy because I brought it to our team, and they weren't really bought in. And, and technically, I am the decision maker, but I also know like I'm not going to do it. So I got to kind of give it to an executive and see if they can do it. You know what I mean? And if, and if they're not, if they don't have the bandwidth right now, we're going to have to hold off on that. So that's the support belief, right? Are the people around me close to me going to support me? and investing in fixing the pain. Then money is the resources and willingness to fix the pain. So that's two different things. Because number one, they have to physically have the resources. Do they physically have the budget? If you're selling a, a fitness program that's $5,000, well, if they only have like $3,000 in their Chase account, they have a $500 credit score. Sure, they can get resourceful and you know sell their car or something, but I'm going to say they just don't have the resources. Like they physically don't have it. Okay. Willingness means they might have the resources, but they have to be willing. So the way I always explain this is uh, one of my clients a long time ago when I did sales coaching was a, uh, well, I still do sales coaching, but we do more sales team building now, but I used to do one-on-one sales coaching. And this guy was a dating coach. And I reviewed a call and he was selling a lawyer who was making 250 K a year into getting his dating life right. And the guy had the resources, but when, when he heard the price, he was like, well, it's just not like worth it. So he had the resources, but he wasn't willing, right? And the lack of willingness ties back to a lack of cost. So it's kind of a symptom of, of, of cost, which we cover, covered earlier. And the final one is trust. And um, that is trusting you. That is trusting the company. But the most important thing is that's you tr- it's, that it's them trusting the methodology. So it's their buy-in that your method to achieving desired state is different, unique, superior, more effective, faster, bigger, better, whatever than what they've tried in the past or there are other alternatives out there. So the key to building trust in the method is that your solution has to be the simultaneous explanation of why everything they tried in the past has failed and why this is going to be different. Does that make sense? So essentially a great example of this is if you read a sales letter from a copywriter who's selling you the ketogenic diet, okay? Well, they don't really come out talking about the ketogenic diet, do they? What they, do, what they, what they start is, is you know, here, here's the one thing that's really kept you fat your entire life. What is it? It's insulin resistance. Here's the problem with insulin resistance. Here's the cost of that. So instead of eating carbs, what we do instead to be able to achieve our weight loss goals is we get into a state of ketosis. And in doing so, we can benefit and ultimately benefit of that benefit. 
right? So by the nature of me explaining to you what getting into ketosis really is, like insulin resistance versus ketosis, by, by the nature of me explaining to you how that works, if you've had trouble losing weight, if it's done correctly, you should understand, number one, why you failed in the past, and number two, why this is going to be different. Does that make sense? Yep. So that's the seven. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and you're right. It is the, that's the science, right? And the art is knowing how to weave these questions in and recognize the pain and where to go deeper, where to pull back a little bit. And um, so you're, you're hiring people, you're training them so they can do it for your clients. Right. But you, you maintain like the management and support. um, So your customers can just go do their thing. Right. Keep making content, giving speeches, whatever. And you're teaching the salespeople and and managing, monitoring them to fulfill for your clients. Yeah. I mean, we don't manage it for them. We do support and coaching and training and all that stuff. But at the same time, you know, for the business owner to really have a seven multi seven, eight figure business, they have to learn the skill of sales management. They have to bring that internal. Okay. If you look at in our industry, which particularly we're in more of like the coaching, consulting agencies, I think it services, that type of stuff. If you look at that industry, there's really nobody in there who there might be like one or two guys, but for the most part, there's really nobody at eight figures who got there with an external outsource sales team. So, and it's a very nowadays, a very sales team driven industry. Like you really need a sales team to be able to scale. So, and that's because of rising ad costs and a lot of other things. So, uh, you know, we really, we, we staff them, we give them the people and we do support, we do coaching, we do call reviews. So we do all of this stuff. We do, we, we tremendous amount of support to really help. And a lot of people use this kind of as an outsourced sort of sales coaching arm for their company. Yes. But I really want the owner to be a leader for that salesperson. So the salesperson can look at the owner and say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to work for this person, you know, because a salesperson is the only person in, the, in any company that can't perform if uninspired. You know, your accountant can do the books perfectly if they're depressed out of their mind, but a salesperson is not going to sell anything without any conviction, without any inspiration. So a lot of that, it comes from the culture. It comes from the belief in the product and the belief in the founder, the belief in, you know, who, maybe it's their sales manager, the belief in that guy. It's got to be, got to be somebody. Yeah. And sometimes that's hard. Uh, do you ever tell clients no or prospects no? Like, dude, you're a stick in the mud. I'm, <laughs> I can't help you. <laughs> Well, yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, we have requirements, obviously. Um, but somebody has to be open-minded trying to build it internally. A lot of people who reach out, I mean, I don't know, they reach out for, it's, it's interesting. They just think we do all sorts of different stuff. They just know the word Cole Gordon and sales team. Like they're like that, you know, that's, that's, that's the extent of their knowledge. Uh, and, they, and they reach out and think we have like a call center or think that we have like, um, I don't know, a bunch of different stuff. But, but typically we're, we're pretty good at, helping people see that the building it internally is the way to really getting to the scale that they want. And they got to build it. Um, or, and we'll give them the, the, the staff members, of course, which is like, you know, a huge pain in the ass, right? Yep. It's, it's much easier to go through a recruiter. Yeah. Uh, and is this working B to C or B to B or. Yeah, both do both. I got, I got two companies. One is B to C, which sells, sales training to consumers. And then the other one's B2B, which sells salespeople to businesses. Um, so I kind of operate a double sided marketplace there. Do, do and, you consider selling to salespeople as B2C? I do. Yeah. I mean, you could consider that kind of this hybrid, I call it B2 solopreneur. Yeah. But I do. To yeah. me, B2B is like a company that's at least doing a mill. Like, I don't even consider, like, if you're doing, like, quarter million, half a million a year, I don't even really consider that totally B2B. That's kind of still, like, B2 solopreneur. Yeah. But at least it's B2, B2, it's, it's B2 consumer with money, at least, a little bit, <laughs> opposed to, like, if you're selling a, a business opportunity, if you're selling um, fitness, dating, stuff like that. That's when you're truly selling to consumers. The advantage is it's an extreme mass market. 
you know? Yeah. So you get really cheap, cheap leads, but the problem is the leads stink. You know? Yeah. And you, you can not really cold calling somebody like, Hey, are you fat? You want to get in the gym? I mean, would that be more of an MDR? Yeah, you, you have to, yeah. With, with those types of offers with the consumers, you have to, in my experience, have some sort of like inbound marketing or content marketing sort of approach. That could be through paid advertising. That could be through own media, earned media, um, affiliates. I mean, it could be through any of that stuff. So, but yeah, you, you're not going to be cold calling people. Uh, cold calling and stuff like that works great when it's a very targeted industry. Um, and especially when you need to go for the top end of the industry. So like for us, like we, we can target people who are business owners in our industry doing a million to 10 million a year, get their name, email, phone number. And we would just reach out to them. Uh, it's definitely a slow burn. Like it's, it's easier to do ads. That's for sure. Um, but it's also like pretty, it's cheaper to do, pick up the phone and call them. Yeah. Uh, are you finding that executives, um, are they easier to reach now or harder to reach after COVID and working from home and, you know, they're not always forwarding their numbers if they're working from home. Um, like what's been your experience? So I will say most of so our range is probably the, the majority is one to 4 million and we, and we go after the founder. So I can't, I can't speak to executives particularly because I don't have necessarily experience trying to contact an executive. Um, but what I will say is that we, for us, it seems pretty easy. I mean, we usually get their email, no problem. And uh, we inbox them. Now, if they respond or not, that depends on the effectiveness of the email and a myriad of other, thing, other things. And then on top of that, um, the number, you know, we get pretty good answer rates too. It's not going to be as good as like an MDR, but we get decent. So I don't find it terribly hard. I think it's easier than people think. I think the biggest thing is the data. So I think the quality of the list really dictates everything else. Like, yes, you have to have good salespeople, but I mean, if, you, if they're calling really bad numbers, you're going to be in some serious trouble. And um, that's why you got to clean your list. It's also how you curate the list. I typically find that if you just, it depends on who you're buying it from, but if you just buy a list, it's probably not going to be very good. So we manually build all of ours, which is a treat. You know, that's hard. Yeah, it's real hard. <laughs> yeah. I guess you've been doing it a while, so it helps. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have several, we have almost a half dozen staff just list building. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and we so probably need to like double that. What does that look like? Are they, are they going through like LinkedIn and stuff or are you running different ads just to curate? No. So basically what we do, we use primarily use seamless AI. So what we, what you want to do is you want to find a, we don't use that the We don't use the search function within seamless AI. Though. What we do, which you can't do that. We can't do it for our industry. So what we need is like, we need some sort of launch point. Um, so what I try to do is I try to find either like a Facebook group, or you could use built with and find a software that they use, or um, it could be a LinkedIn search could work. If that only works like our industry, they don't identify, they don't self-identify, but a realtor does self-identify, right? So you could, you could type in real estate agent in seamless and get a list of real estate agents. But what I would do that would be superior to that is I would look at Zillow and find the ones actually paying for advertising and paying for advertising on all these different platforms and what have you. And I would curate the list based on that, you know, and I would use seamless to so you see what I mean. So you kind of want to have these like launch points to where you find like the best leads based on some sort of criteria, whether it's the software they use, an interest group they're in, whatever. And then what you do after you, after you identify the lead is you got to complete it. So then you use seamless to basically get all of the information, LinkedIn, Facebook numbers, you want every number, you want every email complete it all the way down. But then after that, what the research team does is they write a customized first line for every single person. So they do that. And then we chief them later, which means like we edit them, make sure they're good. So they write a customized first line that we can send to every single person just to make sure it's personal, personalized. Right. So then after that's done, that's the completion phase. Then it goes into cleaning. So we have to clean all the numbers and all of the emails. 
right? So uh, that eliminates a lot of them because you don't want a bunch of dials to wrong numbers and you don't want a bunch of emails to bounces because it can make it mess up your deliverability. So we, we get rid of that. And then uh, after that, I feel like there's another stage, but I mean, then you have a good list. You have the good first lines. Uh, whoever's managing the outreach obviously looks at the first lines and make sure they're like legible, make sure they're good. And then, I mean, you can just send them out one by one. I mean, we use like a mail shake type thing that sends out the emails. And then, you know, other than that, you just pick up the phone and start calling. Yeah. And do you find like people, they don't mind getting calls on their cell phones now? It seems like it's kind of. Well, yeah, some people get pissed. Now. I mean, yeah, some people are going to get pissed. If you're true I, with MDRs, if you're calling leads that were generated by marketing, you might get some hangups, but generally they're not, they don't really care that much. You know, if you call leads though, that are cold leads, yeah. Uh, yeah, they get a little, they get pissed sometimes. Um, that's just the game though. I mean, you're, you're interrupting their day. Uh, and honestly too, like if you sound good and your tonality is on point, I think they're less likely to get mad because I think they're like, Oh, this is like a real guy doing his job and right. trying his best. But some people are just, we've had, we've had, a, we've had a few people just like explode or, you know, threaten to like sue us and stuff. <laughs> so I don't know. You just got to have thick skin, I guess. Why do all the idiots have attorneys? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, they say they're going to sue us, but I don't know they don't, they don't, they usually don't even have an attorney friend, but I mean, some have a friend, but that friend's like, shut up, dude. You're not suing them. It's business. <laughs> mm. I mean, there's nothing against calling someone. No, I mean, there, there's all sorts of, I, I don't know the laws very well off the top of my head, but we, we, we've worked with an attorney on this. I mean, there is risks, but there's risks in everything. Um, so there's certain risks if this and that, I forget the exacts of it, but uh, but if it's B2B, it's generally, uh, yeah. I think the FTC says, you know, if it's B2B, it's business or shit, buyer aware. If it's B2C, it's business aware, mm-hmm. right? So they hold, they hold the business as much more accountable when you're selling to consumers and the other way around. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Reach out. Um, so who's, who's best for you? We're going to, you know, I'm linking to your to your website, um, who should be checking you out? Because uh, it's closers.io, right? Yep. So, I mean, it's two, two types of people. Number one, anybody who wants to get into sales or a current salesperson making less than 100, 150K a year, wanting to get their income to two, three, 400 a year, uh, we can get that person, number one, trained, and number two, placed into a great position, obviously provided they, they do the work you know, and all that stuff. So that's kind of on one side, anybody who's in sales or anybody who um, wants to get into sales, right? And either of those people want to level up. Uh, The latter side is anybody who really has a service or some sort of coaching or some sort of course or some sort of online delivered service, essentially, that's $3,000 to $10,000, if not more. Uh, We do work with some software companies, but, but the big thing we want to see there is a good product market fit. So... Cause you know, with some of the coaching companies and course companies, if the product's not good, I can like help them change it a little bit. And then so we, you know, we can get it to work software a little bit harder to change. Right. So we want to see a good product market fit. And obviously it's gotta be a high ticket. It's gotta be at least three to $10,000. And um, they have to have some sort of established way to generate leads because uh, either they're going to teach that way to the salesperson or they're going to generate leads for the salesperson, but you can't just have the salesperson, you know, you can't just cut them loose and be like, Hey man, just go figure it out. Just go get me business. Like that's your job, dude, as the founder. Like you got to at least set some sort of a baseline of like how we're going to go out and get customers. So to recap, anybody who's in sales or wants to get into sales, number one, feel free to reach out if they want to get placed and get trained. Uh, number two, anybody who needs salespeople, has a product three to $10,000 a month, not more, has the lead flow dialed in. Those are bread and butter. Very cool. I like it. All right. Cole Gordon from Ohio, man. Closers.io. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Despite doing 562 of these, plus over 50 on the CRM Sushi podcast, every now and then the audio gets messed up. So apologize for that. 
Um, looks like it was using the internal mic. Oh, well, the info was good and Cole did most of the talking. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for, and the phrase is kind of abused nowadays, high ticket sales. But, you know, the concept is if it's more than a, a cheap little trinket, if it's in the thousands of dollars range, um, you know, Cole might be able to help you. Uh, if you're doing it on your own, if you just want to get better, looking for ongoing training and support, uh, make every sale is a good refresher. Uh, it's good for new people. It's a good refresher because, look, at the end of the day, um, we're humans selling to humans. And so it's easy to get jaded. It's easy to get in a rut, you know, build a habit. And so it's a good program for everyone at every spectrum um, on the, the sales experience level. Okay. And it's super affordable. So, you know, invest in yourself, get better. And then if you want to talk about things, bounce ideas off of me every week, sellmoreofeverything.com. Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something.